Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and for the trials of the week. We know, Lord, that you are doing a work upon our hearts and our minds, that our thoughts and our feelings are being challenged and being brought into conformity to your law and to your will. And so we ask that as we study together that your Holy Spirit can work powerfully upon our hearts, that we can see things that we have never seen before, that we should have seen if our hearts had been open. And we ask, Lord, that we can see things that can strengthen our faith and trust in you and show us our need of you, show us our sin. Help us to depend upon you. May your angels watch over each one. And may you continue to bless this movement, especially in this week ahead and on this Sabbath. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we had looked at Numbers, chapter 3, if you remember, last week. And the, the Levites, the number of the Levites, the number 273. I mean, we spent a lot of time in the book of Numbers, chapter 3, looking at numbers. And, and of course, that can be a little bit tedious at times. Uh, but what we see is that this message that, is, that this movement is giving is tied up with numbers, with these symbols. And it's tied up with things like the 2520. And uh, somebody's microphone, it's probably Jeff. Um, make a noise there. Thanks, Jeff. So I just wanted to look at, at a couple of numbers that uh, Stephen Jameson pointed out. So, um, of course, these are things that I find very, very interesting, but it relates to our study that we had. So I'm just, before we go looking at these, um, now we were just looking at Acts 27. So in Acts 27, uh, which is a symbolic journey of Paul, that represents this movement, and we did some extensive studies on Acts 27. But there's going to be this point in which they they sound, right? So they're going to figure out, they're going to measure the depths of the water, and they're going to come back with two different measurements, uh, 20 cubits, or not cubits, uh, fathoms, and 15 fathoms. Now, a fathom is 72 inches, so we know that when we take 15 times 72, we get this number, 1080, 1080. And that is how the, the Jewish calendar, how the Jewish um, day is divided as we know. It's 2520, or not 25, 2920 helic or helikin. And the hour is 1080 of those. So, so that's the parts of an hour. So they don't use seconds, they don't use minutes. They use a part that is three and a third seconds long. Now, if we take the 20 fathoms and we uh, multiply them by 72, we get this number 1440. That's one hundredth of 144,000. Now, the interesting thing about these two numbers, if we add them together, we get 2520. So, so we have symbolically represented elements of time, minutes and helic, um, that also give us this number 2520. Now, Stephen then was looking at this, and he found if we took 2520 and multiplied it by 7, which, which we've known for a long time, you get this 17640. Now, the interesting thing about that number is if I add um, uh, 
uh, 1080 to it, I get 18720. So that is 7 times 2520 plus this part of this number, right, this part of 2520 that we get from 15 fathoms. If we add it to 7 times 2520, we get 18720. So that's pretty interesting. Would we say, is that pretty interesting? <laughs> I think it is. I would say so. Okay. Now, if we, now we know the number seven, the significance of that. Now, the number of the resurrection is eight. So if I take 2520 and I multiply it by eight, I get this number 20,160. And if I add the 1440 to that, I have to subtract minus one four four zero and then subtract one four four zero. Then I will also get one eight seven two zero. So if I if, so if I multiply it by seven and add one zero eight zero, I get one eight seven two zero. But of course, we know since those two numbers make twenty five twenty, we we can see why this is the case. Now, when I add one four four zero so that's just the number that we had um, added so this what did i do that was the number we had now when i add one four four zero to that we get this other number now what is this number does anybody know what this number is two one six zero zero so stephen didn't notice this this is the one i noticed when i made this mistake of adding it <laughs> i don't remember that one Okay, we should all know that six times six, whoops, clear. Six times six times six equals 2160. So this is just a hundred times that. Make sense? So we can see how these numbers, 2520, July 18, 2020, you know, 18720, even this number, 21600 which is a number that we, we also have showing up other places, that we have this interaction between the mark of the beast, the 666 number. February 16, is that February 16? Yes, it's also February 16, correct, yeah. So when we look at Samuel Snow's letters, remember his first letters on February 16, that's six times six times six, gives you the starting date of February 16th that we're going to count to get to May 2nd, which is the center of the chiasm. And then we count uh, two months and 16 days for May 2nd to get to July 18th. So the question is, why does this number of the mark of the beast interact with the number seven, right? Because the seven times and 666 interact with each other. And why do they do that? Symbolically speaking. Can you repeat the question? Okay. The number 666 is interacting with the number 7. That is, the 7 is the number of the Sabbath. Okay. And 666 is what? Mark the mark of the beast sunday so when sunday and sabbath interact what is happening oh, churches no. well it's it's the great controversy right right so we can see see some people argue when we see some of these symbols showing up in our lines that means we're satanic <laughs> right but we can see that it should be obvious that there is a controversy going on. The great controversy is being interacted. So for instance, if I take six, six is the number of a man and seven is the number of perfection and I add them together, what do I get? 13. And what is 13? Um, rebellion. Yes. It's rebellion, That's right? So, so, so the number of rebellion is a mixture of truth and error. Can we see that that's correct? 
That is, it's error contradicting truth by while pretending to be truth. Because in Satan's rebellion in heaven, what was he appealing to? Why, what, why did, what, what was wrong? Was he standing in, in opposition to God in an open way? No. He was saying God no. was unjust, right? Yes, he was. I mean. But he was deceitful at the same time. Right. But the thing is, he made it look like he was doing exactly. good. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So that type of rebellion always justifies itself, but it's a mixture of truth and error. And, and that's what we see. So we see that six and seven, when they're combined in this, the basic numbers, you know, six, six, six gives us, you know, it's six, 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 right? And, and we can look at the numbers that we get from seven to 25, 20 comes from seven, 490 comes from seven. Of course, the week, um, the week of Christ is, is seven years, all these different things that are symbols of righteousness, or even our 777 days in our line. We can see that's that's obviously a parallel to 666, that they're related to each other. But they're related to each other because of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And we know also, uh, we saw the 666 in connection with Jehoiachin's captivity and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, being 666 years apart. And Miller used a period of 666 years for Rome. Right. And we also apply it to the papacy as a symbol of the papacy, which it inherits from Babylon. It has its mystery Babylon. So that's why 666 becomes the mark of the beast. So all of these symbols, all of these numbers, I mean, they're in God's providence to teach us something. But they in and of themselves can't change us. They can point us to something. But they're ineffectual to change the human heart other than that they they stand as witnesses so these numbers and these dates and this chronology we don't believe in magic use of numbers you know that if you change your name so it adds up to a good number or if you you make decisions based on numbers that you see because i like that number it's symbolic so i'm gonna you know buy this thing that cost 25 20 dollars you know um it's not a, really a good reason to buy something, right? So we don't believe that numbers, we don't believe in superstition. What we do believe is that God is in charge of the universe and that in his providence, he uses these symbols to illustrate for us truth and error and the great controversy so that we can clearly discern, discern what is truth. And if we reject this, we're going to be rejecting light that God is giving us to protect us. So that's the, the part there that I wanted to look at with just finishing off some of those ideas that we were looking at. Now, there was a bunch of other ideas that, that we were addressing. I mean, we were addressing our chronology, but I wanted this study to move, uh, towards um, understanding the sanctuary. So we looked at this, and what was the reason that we looked at the Levites? What was the, what was the, the point regarding the sanctuary? So we're gonna move from these numbers to, to understanding some other things. And, and we didn't really finish this up. But why is this important? Who are the Levites? Why do they exist? What is the symbol? that's being used, if anybody can remember a week ago. Hello, Huey. Hi, good night, Brother Tito. Yeah, so what we're studying right now is we're looking, we had done a study last week on Numbers chapter three, and we were looking at the Levites and, and what we want to address here today is uh, finish, finish tying up some of those loose ends. It was a pretty long study, um, probably went too long. Um, 
but now we're going to be looking at Numbers chapter 3, not so much in detail. So we saw that in Numbers chapter 3 is the symbol of 273, that is the difference between the number of the, the children of Israel and the number of the Levites. And the number of the children of Israel is 22,273 in the number of the, so that would be the firstborn of the children of Israel. And the number of the Levites of a month old and upward is 22,000. And so the difference is 273. And so this symbol of 273, we know is a symbol of the Levites. But the question here is now not so much about the symbols. The question in the context of the sanctuary study that we're doing, we had looked at this characteristic of the firstborn. So the firstborn of the children of Israel are going to be replaced by the Levites. So what does that tell us prophetically at the end of the world? Some of the verses we brought up, God wanted a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. At the end of time, we use the symbol of the Levites to represent a group of people that's going to uh, stand with, with Moses, let's say, at the Sunday law. Can we agree with that? Because the Levites stood with Moses at the golden calf. Yes, yes. Okay, so we, so we see that the Levites represent something. Now, we have a message to give to the Levites. We know they're Seventh-day Adventists, but they're the Seventh-day Adventists who are going to pass the Sunday Law Test, at least the ones that accept the message, the ones that stand with Moses. And so I would say that one way we should maybe look at the Levites is the Levites, we have a message to give to the Levites, but the one who accepts the message are the Levites, the ones who reject the message are not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So so we talked yeah. about this message to the Levites, but we can't say that all of the the Adventists who are part of the of Adventism are the Levites. Because if they were, they would all stand and pass the Sunday law test. So it's only the ones that pass that technically are the Levites. And and that makes sense. I think people can agree with that, that that's it's not something we ever at least I don't remember it, somebody explicitly stating that before, but that so, to me seems to be so, consistent with the symbol. So, so that that's going to be the remnant. That, that's the remnant is different from those that pass the sun that the sun a lot of things. You you use the word remnant. Yeah. Well, I I guess you could use it in that sense because we know it's the remnant that are going to. Uh, it's the words well in revelation if we go to Rem revelation um what's the where do we get that here just hang on i gotta find the verse uh, so in revelation we got remnant mention The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at this, that the that the dragon is going to send out this flood out of his mouth, right? The earth opened her mouth and the swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that she might be carried away of the flood. So when does this happen? So we know that this is talking here about, in verse 14, the 1260 years, correct? That when we have this time, times and a half a time, this is not some future yes. uh, literal 1260 days. It's something that was fulfilled in the past. Yeah. But then it says, and, and, and when the serpent cast out of his mouth of water as a flood after the woman, what would that be?
that would be persecution, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But we know that the flood also represents the Sunday law. Okay. So, so we, we could say then that this history that happened in the past is going to be repeated. Yeah. And, and then when it says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, that's not during the 1260 years, is it? It doesn't, it doesn't seem like that. No, we know that that's, that's future. Yeah. The remnant of her seed, so the seed of the woman flees into the wilderness for 1260 years, but it's going to be the remnant of her seed that is the last part in the future that's going to demonstrate the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the testimony of Jesus Christ is what? Spirit of prophecy. Okay, so we always say spirit of prophecy. But is that really what it is? I mean, I, I agree that we can call the testimonies and we can use this verse. I'm not saying that we can't. Well, so all the correct doctrine, correct represents all correct doctrine. Okay. Is there any connection between the testimony and the covenant? Well, yeah, I'd say so. Okay. Because we know we have the old covenant. We also call it the Old Testament. Okay. Now, now Dwight's making a case that that covenant is a covenant that God makes with his people. If we have the covenant of Jesus Christ, we, we keep the commandments of God, but we also have the covenant. So what would that covenant be that, that we need to have in, in, in a literal sense and then in a symbolic sense? Because the covenant has to do with the blessings and the curses, does it not? That's a good part of it, yes. Yeah, and, and the 2520 is part of that testimony of Jesus Christ. Because he confirms the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he causes sacrifice and oblation to cease. We say that that's Christ 2520. And, and Christ demonstrates he's he's the true 2520 his cross he's the true curse because he was made a curse for us cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree Christ is made a curse he's he's hung upon a symbol of pagan worship something that's not a Christian symbol he is he is a curse and that curse is the 2520 curse because that curse is part of the covenant. But Christ is going to minister three and a half years on earth, three and a half years in heaven. In that also, also a gathering too, 2520. Yeah, there's a gathering that goes along with it for, the, for Judah, but not for, for northern Israel. I mean, there is a gathering for Northern Israel, but it's going to be spiritual, right? So there are two different 2520s, uh, two different different ways. There's the 2520 of Daniel 4, which is Nebuchadnezzar seven times, and there's the 2520 of Belshazzar. We can also see, and and went in the butler and the baker. What are the butler and the baker in the story of Joseph representing? But there we have three days. That's the period of time. But do they represent two classes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so they represent the two 2520s. 
just as much as Leah and Rachel do, even though they're not represented as seven days or seven years, it's three days, but they're tied to the prediction before midnight. So we can see that um, the, this, this battle, this controversy that's going on, and I know Huey missed it and some other people might have missed it, where we were talking about uh, the symbols of 666 and the symbol of 777, or even just the symbol of 6 and 7, that they represent uh, the great controversy. That is, when they come together, they represent this great controversy. And, and so we know what happened in the past in the great controversy happens at the end, and that's with the remnant. And, and this study, when we talk about the remnant of her seed, remember, we, we started with Genesis chapter 1 and with this study, but we went to Genesis chapter 3, and one of the main threads that we were looking at was the seed of the woman, Christ. And he's gone all through this story, but he's there at the end, but he's represented at the end, not personally, but in his people who keep the commandments of God and have this covenant of Jesus Christ. That is the covenant that was confirmed with many for one week. These people have that covenant. They have the 2520. Not just some number, but they have this experience of Christ because they've taken up their cross daily and died. And can we see then that the 2520 is about the cross? Yeah, yeah. We can yeah. Christ, yeah. Now, one of my favorite verses is... Um, Matthew chapter 11. Um, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is a yoke a chiasm? Why is it a chiasm? Because it's the same shape on one side as it is the other. Yeah. So, so it has the structure of a chiasm. And actually, if you look at how we draw our chiasms, they, they kind of look like a yoke, don't they? I think so. Now that you mention it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if you look at a yoke... Um, I'm just going to see if I can pick up a, an image of a yoke. Isn't that the whole point of here's just yoke? here's just an example of a yoke. Center center would be the would be the steer, and then the yeah yeah outside would be how you steer steer them. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's just an example. I'll just switch to it just so everybody who maybe if you haven't seen a yoke before, here's what a yoke looks like. Isn't that kind of what we draw? You know, this <laughs> part of it, this wood part? Isn't that a chiasm? Yeah. This is the first 1260. This is the second 1260. And then you have this center here. That's where... Um, your pivotal point. Yeah, your pivotal point is. So, <laughs> so, so you can see that Christ, in asking us to yoke up with him, he's asking us to take up his cross, which is the center of a chiasm. So I, I think, you know, to me, it's quite powerful when we understand that this covenant, this week of Christ, this 2520, has not been about what people have thought it's about. Because I think for many people in this movement, it's been about us and them. It's been about, really, for many, a rebellion against God, even though they are standing for the truth, it appears, on the one hand. But it's people wanting to see themselves as better than others. But the cross is quite different. It's what Moses said, blot my name out of the book. 
That's the cross. That's the experience that we have to have. What draws all people to Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because when we're lifted up as an enzyme, we're not lifted up as an enzyme for our sake. We're lifted up as an enzyme for Christ's sake. And we were focusing upon the idea that we would be vindicated, not that Christ would be vindicated. And that's why many people, when July 18th didn't happen, they were embarrassed. And what were they embarrassed of? Weren't they ashamed of the cross? We shouldn't be ashamed of the cross. We shouldn't be ashamed to be despised and rejected. Well, Jesus was, so we're supposed to follow yeah. after his example. And in order to learn of him, we have to take up that yoke. And we have to become meek and lowly in heart. And this rest that we find, which is the Sabbath rest, is something that comes from connection with Christ. As Seventh-day Adventists, many Seventh-day Adventists don't keep the Sabbath, even though they go to church every Sabbath. And even if they, you know, they don't watch any sports or they don't, you know, talk worldly talk even, they could be people who, who just keep the Sabbath and they keep it strictly, but they don't keep the Sabbath because they think of themselves as better than others. And that's, that's against the spirit of Christ. If we're comparing ourselves to others, we can make ourselves think that we're good. But we can, when we yoke up with Christ, we know of our need of him. You will be a fair bunch of Pharisees, and we'll be Pharisees. Yeah, and, and it's easy to say, right? It's easy to look back at other people and say, well, I'm not like these other men are. You know, I fast twice in the week and give tithe of all that I possess. I'm not like this publican. Or I'm not like this Pharisee. So we can do the same thing. Uh, you know, say, well, I'm not like a Pharisee. When we actually are worse than a Pharisee. When we can't see ourselves as we truly are. We've looked in the law. We've looked in the mirror. But we walked away from that mirror and not recognized, not remembered what type of person we were. That's in James chapter 1. But when we look into the law of liberty and we see things spiritually, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So we can look at the law in two different ways. And the law is a mirror, and is the mirror a chiasm? That's what it is by very definition. So this is what God has been calling us to. That's what this movement has been about. So when we look at this message of the sanctuary, and I've tried to figure out, where do I go next? I mean, I didn't want to go through all the details of Leviticus. That is, I didn't want to go through all the sanctuary furniture and all the, even though it's very tempting to do so. It's just, it would take too much time. We'd need to do a daily study on this topic. But we could see that that all the furniture of the sanctuary is tied up prophetically as symbols in the book of revelation and and that the sanctuary represents time and it represents god's work of salvation through time and that reform lines are god's work of salvation through time that is he's un, he's undoing what was done in genesis chapter 3 when adam and eve sinned and he's undoing it through the promise of the seed, the seed of the woman. But the seed of the woman is not just Christ. It's the remnant of his seed that exists at the end. And we know this as Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, we, we know it, sort of. But it's not something that we dwell upon. Because Adventism is be, has not rejected Protestantism. It's become like the Protestants. We don't believe in overcoming sin or taking up our cross daily and following him. 
And if we do, it's more a sentimental type of religion. But it's no different for this movement than it is for regular Adventists. We may talk about the things that we believe and think that this makes us better than them, but in making us think that we're better than them, in us thinking that, it means we're worse than them. Correct? Because the worst condition you can be in, Ellen White says, is to think that you're all right when you're all wrong. That is not to see yourself as you truly are. Because God can do nothing for you if you can't see that you're a sinner. If you're comparing yourself with men, nothing can be done. And so the sanctuary truth is all about us coming to recognize who we are. We'd be like Peter before his conversion. Yeah. And, and we fool ourselves to think that we're converted. I mean, I'm not saying that God's not working in our lives. But conversion is not something that happened once and now I'm converted. You know, on August 11th, 1980, I gave my heart to Christ. If that's the only time I ever gave my heart to Christ, I'm a lost man. We have to give our heart to Christ every day, every moment. That's, that's the time when we start the journey, when we give our heart to the Lord. That's when we start right. our journey at that, but doesn't doesn't end. Yeah, and of course, God couldn't show me everything all at once, could he? You couldn't handle it. No, no, I, would, I, couldn't, I just couldn't handle it. Yeah. If I would have known what my life was going to be like, just from, from an external point of view, just looking at, the things that I was going to, that would have to change, I would have not accepted that. I mean, I would have died. I mean, I could not have faced who I was when I was 17 years old. Um, but but Christ accepted me then. But doesn't that go for every one of us? Mm -hmm. Because if we were to see ourselves for who we truly were, we could not be in the presence of that and endure the agony that it would cause us to even recognize it. Yeah. So so we've all had to go through this experience of continual conversion. And now some people want think that there's some point where you get converted and then everything's going to be easy from then on. Right? I mean that's what people were looking for with November 9th. Some people still were even looking for that for July 18th. And some people, even with December 25th, are still looking for a close of probation, thinking that a close of probation means I'm now perfect and I don't need to worry about sin anymore. But the 144,000, they're perfect. Do they see themselves as righteous? Far from it. Well, certainly not. Right. Yeah, they're not focused upon the good things that they've done and the wonderful things that they believe and how how much they've, that's the wicked. The wicked say, haven't I done this? Haven't I done that? No, the righteous fear lest they have some sin that is unforgiven, that they're not going to represent Christ perfectly, that they're not going to pass the test. And so all they can do is say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They can only cling to him as Christ did when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was upon the cross. And so this invitation, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, is not rest from labor. I mean, it is in a sense if you look at labor as being your sins, so you're heavy laden. He's going to give you rest. But you're actually working with him. You're cooperating with Christ. And only then can you have rest. Now, I want to go to Numbers 33. So I'm skipping a whole bunch of things in the book of Numbers, all kinds of things that we could look at. But this is what I've chosen to do. And I choose Numbers 3 and Numbers 33 
just like Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33. What is Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33 about? Ezekiel 3, it's part of his first vision, and it's 33, his last vision. Okay, well, 33 is not his last vision, but he has the same message. It's about the watchman, right? So Ezekiel 3 and 33 tie together the same message. Now, I'm arguing here that is that uh, Numbers 3 and Numbers 33 are touching on the same topic, though it's not quite as clear. That is, number three is dealing with the Levites, right? So this is the Levites replacing all of the firstborn of the children of Israel. So you're going to have the redemption of the firstborn. But we know in the story of the Exodus, now this is, of course, going to be the journeys when they leave. But in the story of the Exodus, it's about the redemption of the firstborn, is it not? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what happens on Passover. It's the firstborn that's going to die in each house if there's no blood on the lintel or the doorposts, if that lamb hasn't been slain, if it hasn't been eaten, right? So, so you're going to have this the same story, but now they're going to leave. So Numbers 33 is going to be after this redemption of the firstborn. And, and they're going to depart from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. So on the 14th day of the first month at even, that is the at the beginning of the 14th, the Passover lamb is going to be slain. And that night, the, the death angel comes and kills all the firstborn of the Egyptians because they don't have the blood on the doorposts and the lintel. And then the children of Israel are going to live, leave on the 15th day of the first month. This is going to be April 26th in 1533 BC. And this Passover, this, this 15th day of the first month, it's the day after the Passover, right? So, so we have the Passover, now we have this journey. And they're going to travel. And there's, there's lots of stuff in here. Uh, but in verse 4, it says, For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them. Upon the gods also the Lord executed judgments. So what is the firstborn? We went through this last week. But what is the firstborn? What does it typify? The 144,000. Okay. So it typifies the 144,000. We can agree to that. But it also typifies Christ as well. Correct? Because Christ is the firstborn of all creation. You can't have one without the other. Right. right. So, so we know that Christ and the firstborn are tied together. And, but it's, it's also how the 144,000 are tied to this. Because the seed of the woman, we had this inheritance the double portion, um, uh, the priesthood and the kingship. Well, God wants to have a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so he is doing this with Israel. He's going to take them out of Egypt. He wants a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, we saw in uh, what happened at the golden calf is that the Levites then were separated out because they stood with Moses. And so we see that there's always this separation, that God is, is moving through history, sifting people until he has this pure church at the very end. And that pure church at the very end isn't made of people who were perfect to begin with. It's made of people who were redeemed by the blood of Christ. That is, that blood that was put on the the doorpost and the lintel is what redeemed them. And so it's the firstborn that are redeemed, but the firstborn are going to be replaced by the Levites. 
by the priests. Now, um, we know also that in Numbers 33, and we looked at this before, that Aaron's going to die on the first day of the fifth month. So when they leave on the 15th day of the first month, this of course is at the beginning of their journeys, but the 15th day of the first month here is April 26th, which is a symbol of the first day of the first month because it's the first day of the first month in 457 BC. That is the first day of the first month in 457 BC is April 26th. And so we can take this story of the Exodus from Egypt and parallel it to coming out of Babylon in 457 BC. Now, of course, we're going to have 40 years and then Aaron's going to die. And Stephen had pointed out that Aaron dies prior to um, them crossing the Jordan River. It's going to be a little while before, and it's going to be like seven months before, right? So he's going to die on the first day of the fifth month in the 30 in, um, and where is it here? I just had it. Um, I skipped it. Yeah, in verse 38, and Aaron the priest went up into Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there in the 40th year, so this is 39 years, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the first day of the fifth month. And Aaron was 123 years old when he died in Mount Hor. So he's three years older than Moses. And so what's the significance of Aaron dying on the first day of the fifth month? What does Aaron represent? Well, it's an Ezra, the first day, fifth month in Ezra. Yeah. So we have the first day of the fifth month in Ezra. So we have these symbols, a little bit different, but they're still the same thing. And the first day of the fifth month, I, I don't think we've fully understood what the first day of the fifth month represents. That is, remember this movement when it compared dates, and we would look at the first day of the fifth month, and we'd look at the first day of the first month, and the first day of the tenth month, the tenth day of the seventh month, and, and we would see in the fifth day of the fourth month, all of these different dates that we had in Millerite history, we saw that lined up with symbols. And the first day of the fifth month is a hidden symbol in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter um, 20, I always get mixed up. I have to have a way of remembering this one. Um, so in Ezekiel, it's chapter is it 26 or 25. Yeah, 26. So when you have it came to pass in the 11th year, the first day of the month, that's going to be the first day of the fifth month. It's uh, basically a few weeks after Jerusalem's walls were broken down and Tyre is going to mock, right? Um, so you have, aha, aha, she is broken. That was the gates of the people. I guess it just says aha once, right? So, so Tyre is going to, to mock Jerusalem because it's been broken. And then there's going to be a judgment against Tyre because of this. So that means Babylon's going to come in and, and punish Tyre. But we also have this here in Numbers 33. And who, who is Aaron? And what would his death mean? Who is Aaron? Well, yeah, who is he? I mean, we know who he is, but who is he symbolically? Okay, well, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, who he, who is symbolically is also connected to who he is literally. <laughs> right? He's the priest. He's the high priest, isn't he? Yes. Okay. So Aaron's the high priest and he's going to die on the first day of the fifth month. Why does he die on the first day of the fifth month? What's the first day of the fifth month symbolize in Millerite history?
for day of the fifth month, August 15th, what is it? It's the midnight cry, correct? So why does Mo why does Aaron die on the first day of the fifth month? What is the midnight cry then? What is Aaron's death on the first day of the fifth month telling us about August 15th, 1844? Can you give us a hint? Okay, I'll, I'll give you another hint. How old was Aaron when he died? 123. Okay, what's what's 123? Are we sure that it's, where did we find that? Uh, numbers 33, 38, and 39. So it says he died on the first day of the fifth month, and then he was 123 years old oh, when he died in Mount Hor. Right I mean, if we wrote out 123, it's just one, two, three, right? Mm -hmm. Does that have anything to do with numbers? Three numbers in order. Okay, one, two, three. And if I counted one, two, three, is it also a symbol of three days? Oh yeah, never mind. Of course it is. <laughs> and if you add the digits together, it gives you six. Yes, right. it gives you six, yep. And there's probably more, but one, two, three to me is significant just because of the simplicity of it. But the question is, why does Aaron die at the midnight cry? Because who is he? He's a priest. Now, of course, we have Moses and Aaron, right? You know, they're brothers. They're three years difference in age. Moses is going to die when he's 120. He's going to die uh, a number of months later. And we have Moses' death. What, what's Moses' death associated with? One hundred and twenty. Okay, it's one hundred and twenty. What's one hundred and twenty? Is that also not a symbol of the first day of the first month? Mm -hmm. From the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month in symbols, it's one hundred and twenty. So, are Moses and Aaron the same symbol? Different aspects of the same symbol. Okay. I've so never really considered it that way before. Okay. So why did why is this symbol of the midnight cry here in this story at the end of their journeys 40 years in the wilderness? They're gonna have this symbol of the first day of the fifth month. We have this priest, and then we have Moses, who's he's also, of course. A Levite, because he's of the sons of Levi, but he's not the high priest, even though he can go before God. So he, he acts almost in some ways like a high priest, but, but he's not. He's a leader. He's, he represents Christ, but of course, so does Aaron. Now, we have these way marks in our lines, right? We have... You know, the first day of the first month, the midnight, the midnight cry, the Sunday law. And, and we think of, of the midnight cry as basically giving a message. A message is empowered. 
But here we have some symbols. And how do these symbols accord with what we already understand about the first day of the fifth month? In Millerite history, what did the first day of the fifth month do? Like all the things that it did. Just think about them. Let's brainstorm this a bit. So we would just say it empowered the message. What else did it do? When was it that the uh, Protestants rejected the message? Okay, that would be the first day of the first month. So this this is the second angel's message arrives April 19th. The Protestants have rejected that message because they don't accept the chronology that makes April 19th, for instance, the first day of the first month. So, so they've rejected that. So this is a test within Millerite history. This is in the Tarian time. So as we know, it's, well, Iran says it's in the empowerment of the second angel's message. We know that. But what else occurs then? What about snow? His message is empowered at the midnight cry. So why do we have Aaron dying? on the first day of the fifth month. So you have a message that's empowered, but don't you have a people accepting a message? Snow's message now becomes the message, the seventh month movement. Can we see that the torch is passed on to some degree on the first day of the fifth month? There's a new. What's that? But the torch is passed on to Joshua. Yeah, it's going to be, yeah. Okay, so Moses passes it on to Joshua. Obviously, Aaron isn't going to pass it on to Joshua. Joshua doesn't become the high priest. But it's going to be passed on to one of his sons. It's going to be the high priest. Now, one of the things that we had looked at with our lines is we had... November 9th as being midnight and July 18th as being the midnight cry. That's one way we looked at our dates. And what we can see is as we progress through these times, there's a transition that occurs. It is you have all the children of Israel come out of Egypt. They're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, but with the rebellion that happened with the golden calf, the Levites become the priests. They take that message. But you also see that that message continues to grow and to pass on. That you're not going to just have Moses and Aaron. Neither of them go into the promised land. They're going to be led by Joshua. So when it comes to, I mean, there's lots of other things, I guess, that we could look at. There's lots of other ideas. But the one thing that, that jumps out to me is that when this movement is lifted up as an enzyme, or when we're lifted up as an enzyme, when the mid midnight and the midnight cry are given, it's not going to be about us as individuals. That this movement, what's going to happen in the world is going to be something we know that when Reve the angel of revelation 18 comes down it joined the third angel and that it's going to swell to a loud cry 
and we have we've come to the conclusion that 9-11 is not on the big line. It only exists as part of the Sunday law on the big line. That is, 9-11 is the beginning of the Sunday law. Because it's the angel of Revelation 18, which Ellen White places as the Sunday law. And so when we zoom into our history, we start to see that there's this reform line that we've been a part of. And this reform line is coming to an end. That is, on December 25th, our line ends. Is God's reform line, is this, is this message, is everything that God done has done then finished? Does it mean that we failed because we didn't accomplish our task in the time that we believed was allotted? I would say no. Yeah, it's not going to fail. But can we see that like Moses and Aaron, this movement has to die? In a certain sense. In order for it, in order for it to thrive. Yeah, strange wives. Right. So there, there's lots of different symbols that we have. We have, of course, the 20th day of the ninth month. That's Ezra chapter 10, putting away the strange wives. So we have always thought that this movement was about us. But this movement is about God's message. It's about Christ completing his work. And the message of the sanctuary, which we're studying here, is tied up with everything that this movement has been through because it's a yoke. It's a chiasm. It's a structure that represents Christ. And we don't know what's going to happen. All we know is that we have accomplished our task as a movement, not I'm saying as individuals, because as individuals, we still have to keep going. But we have to recognize that FFA the Jeff are no longer a part of what's happening. And that these, the, the death of Aaron, however you want to look at it, the death of Moses, those are all things that are typifying what happened with this movement. But then we have Christ. Joshua is Christ. Who is the leader of this movement? Christ alone. Christ alone. No man was ever going to take over that leadership. Not Parminder, not Mark Bruce, not Ch Chawatu, not me, no one, not, not Bronwyn, you know, not any of the people who, who some people look to to think that they should lead, not Daniel Fontenot. None of us. It's Christ. And as individuals, we can be saved. We can still do this work, but our symbols come to an end on December 25th of what we understood about our line. Doesn't mean that our work is done as individuals, but symbolically this movement comes to an end December 25th. And that means something new has happened or will happen. And we just don't know what that is. We have to continue to do the work that God gave us to do. Because as individuals, we've learned from this movement. But Christ is leading and he's preparing God's people for the Sunday law. And the part that we had to play, the part this movement had to play, let's say, not necessarily us, but the movement, the purpose of this movement is still valid. So when we looked at the midnight cry as being July 18th, we also recognized that it was a period of time that ends on December 25th. That is July 18th to December 25th, that period of 525 days. 
is the midnight cry message. And maybe we can say it's from the death of Aaron to the death of Moses. I don't know how you would try to define that. But our line ends. Now, what does this have to do with the sanctuary? Because we're studying the sanctuary. So we know that there's this, this reform line and it's, and it's going to end, you know, with the death of Moses and Aaron. And then, of course, there's this new reform line, however we want to look at that. But what does this have to do with the sanctuary? Like, we're studying the sanctuary here. We've been studying the firstborn, which is part of the sanctuary message. So when they go into the promised land in Numbers 34, they, they divide up the land and, and then you're going to have the cities for the Levites and uh, et cetera. So the cities of the Levites, cities of refuge. What is this all representing? The entering into the promised land, the crossing of the Jordan River. So you're asking, what is this representing? Yeah, what's this all representing? This, this dividing of the land, the cities for the Levites, the cities of refuge. You know, and, and when we look at J uh, Joshua, because that's where we're going to move next here, in the story of Joshua, Remember, they're going to cr cross the Jordan River on the 10th day of the first month. And what is the 10th day of the first month? It's the day the lamb was to be selected. Yeah, the day the, yeah, so the day that the lamb is selected for the Passover is the 10th day of the first month. And so that lamb was selected on the 10th day of the first month, 40 years before they crossed the Jordan River. And God declares the end from the beginning. So what is Joshua 4.19? Is it April 19? Interesting symbol. And is the 10th day of the first month the same symbol as the first day of the first month in some ways? Right, I'd, have to, I'd, I'd have to see a presentation on that. Well, if you take out the zero, they, they both have one and one, right? Just one's 10. And All one. right. Right. So one is just a, uh, is is a tenth of t a tenth. <laughs> um, so so you have all of these symbols. So and these these symbols, all these different dates, all these Bible verses, they're telling us something. They're not just something that we look at as a curiosity. They're supposed to be giving us information, and we can see that Christ is taking up His work. That we don't, we'll no longer have a man as a leader. That has to be very, very clear. And when this work is accomplished, it's because we're cooperating with Christ, not because we have some leader, some organization that's going to be directing the movement. And sometimes we don't know how to function without that. That is, 
The responsibility is placed upon each person who knows this message to do the things that God tells them to do each day and to trust that God is taking care of his movement, of his message, of his people, and that he is going to take the work into his own hands and it will be evident that it was not the work of man, but that it was the work of God. I believe that this is what's happening to this movement now. And it's, it doesn't need a leader other than Christ to do this, because if each one of us does what God is telling us to do, and Christ is our leader, isn't he the best leader that we could possibly have? Amen to that. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. And I don't know how he's going to do it. He will obviously has all kinds of people all over the world. And these people will be accomplishing little things. And, and we may look at what some other people are doing and wonder why they're doing it. We might say, well, they're not, they don't believe exactly like us. But God is working with them just as he worked with us. So I, I don't necessarily know what I'm saying. That is, I don't know. I don't know why we've come to this point in this movement. Why we've come to where we are at, how we got here, really, other than that we've we've come here. You know, it wasn't what we thought was going to happen. We have just one week left for this movement to learn its lesson, but it's not, it's not an organization that's going to learn the lesson. It's each of us individually. Um, I know that uh, tomorrow, I believe, I'm just going to check this here, but... Um, Um, when it comes to, well, I get a lot of emails. Um, tomorrow, Toby is doing the sermon with the American group. And the last time Toby did a sermon, when was that? Well, it wasn't December 6th, but it was before December 6th. Before December 6th. It was like a week before. Correct? Dwight, do you remember when Toby did his second sermon? He did two, and the one that they rejected. Can't remember which date it was. But anyway, it's, I, it was before. I, I, remember, I remember the sermon because I did the Sabbath school. Yeah, but either, either a week or two weeks before December 6th. I think it was two weeks before. Yeah, December 5th, of course, is the Sabbath. So I think it was two weeks before. Um. But Toby's going to be doing a sermon again. And I'm praying that he gives that same message. Because that message was, we're all wrong. Right? You got it. There was no us and them. That we're the ones who right and you're the ones that wrong. We're all in bad shape. So I'm praying that he gives that same message because that was a powerful message. Was it recorded? Yep. I, I actually have it, I believe, on my YouTube page. Uh, I'm just going to check here. Yeah. It, um, and I have the dates for them. So it was... Uh, it's actually November 28th. So that's, I guess, a week before no November 5th. So, uh, uh, or December 5th. So it was a week before and one day from December 6th. And then the first one was uh, October 
17th. So he did one October 17th and then November 28th. Um, and it was entitled Caleb Speaks, part one and part two. So those are on my YouTube page. And you are talking about this year, right? 2020. 2020, okay. Yeah, this is 2020. So this was before December 6th, before they wrote the declaration. And so the message that Toby gave was rejected by FFA. And, and probably rejected by all of us in some degree. So, you know, so I'm praying for the message tomorrow, praying for all the things that are happening in this movement. I want everyone to pray for this movement because we just don't know what the future looks like other than that there is a cross before us, that the work that Christ did in the sanctuary was for us, that we could reflect his character, that we could enter into his presence, that he could restore that which was lost and that the purpose that man was created for will be fulfilled in us and that this is going to come with us yoked up with Christ doing the work that he did with the same spirit, the same character, the same mind that he did it. That all of this self will be gone. And we're not going to be focused upon whether our probation is closed or not. We're not going to be focused upon whether whether we can see enough righteousness in ourselves to believe that we are God's, that we are God's children, that we are doing his work, but that we can see that we are Christ's by faith. So this is where we're at. You know, this is where we've come to. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I know some of you are very quiet in these studies. I've, uh, I've appreciated your comparisons and associations with other things that I haven't thought of before. Mm -hmm. and, and Bonnie says she's listening, listening intently, yeah. which means she's listening with intent. Yes, I think we know that. Right, right but we often don't think of that. Oh, I see. <laughs> because what is our, our intent? Our intent is to reflect Christ's character. So I pray that you guys are going to have a blessed Sabbath. Um, we are. I'm going to have a friend over again, one of my guitar students, Luke. He's going to be here during the time that Toby's presenting. So I'm going to. We're going to be watching it and uh, probably discussing it a little bit. But uh, I'll probably watch it again afterwards. But yeah, there's a lot going on. And uh, so we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for this message. And we need to pray that we are working in cooperation with our leader, with Christ. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the way that you lead us in our personal lives, in the conviction that you bring upon our hearts and you know, Lord, how far we are away from you. We ask, Lord, that our filthy garments can be removed and that we can be clothed with a garment of Christ's righteousness. 
but we hardly understand what that means. We just know it's your purpose for us. We hardly know what it means to reflect Christ's character because we hardly know Christ. And we know, Lord, that you have people all over the world who are seeking for light, who want to know Christ desperately, and that you've given each of us a mission to reach those that are the most in need, that are going to be receptive to a message. And it may just be one person. But like the COVID virus, it can spread. This is not the Omicron virus. We're asking for the Alpha and the Omega virus of Christ's character, that it can be spread, that it can be infectious, that your character can be transferred through your word from person to person that your kingdom will be made up and that this work will be accomplished. Thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath and for the messages that you give us. And thank you for each person. We pray that we can continue to pray for one another and that we can see the need that we have, and that you can fulfill it. Help us to yoke up with Christ. Be with us now. Throughout this Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.